This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. As citizens or proto-citizens of the, of the colony, and by extension a hundred years ago to citizens or proto-citizens of, of the Habsburg or post-Habsburg state. And this then made me think of other kinds of histories of public history, um, the kinds of, of memorial sites that refugees have created. Um, my, one of my favourites is the, um, the boat that is set in concrete, the prow of a ship that Vietnamese refugees have set up in, in, Indone- in uh, Indonesia, uh, not without controversy, but a kind of, you know, testimony to the fact that their parents or grandparents were, you know, boat people, and we can talk about you know, boat people uh, a, a great deal if we, if we wanted to. Um, but this is a kind of site that is, as it were, a, a site created by refugees themselves. Or I'm thinking also of, of memory books, which are, you know, well known if you visit the U.S. Uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, but which have a um, a kind of resonance and, and, and reality for Armenian refugees in the 1920s and beyond, for um, uh, Palestinian refugees, very powerful kind of evocations of the, the place that we left and you know, how, it, how it's imagined or reimagined uh, in, in the kind of historical record. And then all kinds of other things, uh, you know, websites and oral history projects that uh, that are very impressive in relation, for example, to, to the partition of India and the refugee crisis after 1947. And then, <clears throat> thanks to, I think it appears on, on Jessica's website, this re- recently by Frederica Kent Kovac, um, um, drew attention to something I really didn't know anything about, which is, is really fascinating in the light of what's happening in Hungary in 2014 and 2015 which is uh, a project in the uh, Trianon uh, Museum in Budapest um, to create a a kind of uh, record of Hungarian refugees who were displaced after World War I, that's to say displaced from their homes into the the truncated state of of Hungary, and who lived for months, if not years, in in railway wagons, uh, the so-called railway dwellers. and I thought that was just a, a kind of you know, poignant but very striking and, and if you like, ironic uh, I- indication of, of how you know, the record of displacement in Hungary can be read I- in all sorts of different ways, you know, not just the familiar story about what happens to Hungarian DPs or Hungarians in 1956, um, but a kind of, if you like, a, a, a narrative or, or, of, a, of a moment that was very powerful and a very compelling record. Um, <clears throat> But then lastly, I wanted to, to, to draw your attention to this question that's very troubling, which is about the voice of refugees and, if you like, their, their access to the microphone. Um, and here I think we do need to think very, very carefully about you know, who gets to speak and the ways in which certain kinds of, of, of groups or individuals or elites can claim to represent, can claim to speak on behalf of all refugees from a given population, and how one could, as it were, one should, I think, subvert that sort of homogenization or that appropriation to begin to acknowledge that you know different generations will have a different outlook. Uh, there, there isn't a uniform uh, gender take on, on displacement. Um, differences of class and occupation also have to be factored in. So the public history is, is a very complicated thing. And I, I'll end with a, a quote that I came across from a, um, <coughs> um, a, an anthropologist working on Palestinian refugee camps, Juliana Hammer. And uh, I, I've always thought this was a rather wonderful quote that she has from one of her informants, uh, a boy or a teenager or a young adult male, <coughs> Who, who said, my mother told us about Palestine, but she didn't know the plots. In other, in other words, that there's, there are diff- there's different kinds of histories going on here, and that there's a kind of intimate or, or family, family history which I can get from my mother. But she's an old woman, 
And what we, we don't get is the sense of a kind of, uh, of purposeful narrative, you know, the, the plotted narrative. And I thought that was deeply revealing. Um, it has its own kind of offensiveness. Um, but, you know, that the public history is not to be, to be crammed into one kind of, uh, of, of, of framework, that it's, that it's multifaceted, multidimensional, and if I say it's complicated, then I think you'll forgive me. I hope you will. Thank you, Peter. Um, so moving on from the multiple sites and ways refugees could be creating or have public issues created for them and how they might speak or be spoken for, we're now going to hear Susie Symes, who is on the chair of 19 Princelet Street, the Museum of Immigration and Diversity. But before that, she was an economist in the Treasury and on the EU Commission and director of the European Programme at Chatham House. Thank you. So I'm going to be much more micro. 19 Princeton Street, the Museum of Immigration, is a really unique cultural institution. Three of its core, in fact its core founders, were refugees themselves. And they came from extremely different cultural and religious backgrounds, but they shared one thing. And that was a vision of a place that could tell all our stories, not a single story. It was a place about and for all of us, and as one of them, the late Rabbi Hugo Grin said, and for who will come next. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the museum. I'm going to show you <coughs> a part of a short film. And I'm going to end with some examples of just how we, in our own work, uh, do draw on history. Just a few examples on how we draw on history <coughs> to talk about or to connect with today's refugee and migrant crisis. I'm sorry to use that language, but we're all using this as a sort of shorthand. So at the end of the last <coughs> century, I thought that would be appropriately historical. It's quite scary being an economist talking to a group of historians. <laughs> at the end of the last <coughs> century, uh, I'd just become chair of the Museum of Immigration. And there was about threepence in the kitty and I was really keen to get some support quickly and I'd just been showing around a very grand person and after I'd taken him around our building I walked him uh, from Brick Lane which is where we're based to the edge of the city of London and he turned to me as I left him and he said you know it's a lovely building absolutely lovely really lovely place but uh, the trouble with it is the trouble with your museum is it's just too late hmm. Okay. Yes, it's too late. Racism is over in this country, and there's no need at all for what you're on about. So I just simply cannot tell you how much I wish that he had been right, and I had been wrong. Because clearly racism isn't over. Whether you think that the surveys and the data show us that racism has declined or increased or changed and become more structural or less institutionalised, racism isn't gone. Second of all, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim sentiment, xenophobia, these things are stronger than they were then <coughs> and probably stronger in past months. And of course, when we see displaced people who are cold, who are hungry, who are without shelters on our borders, and we see displaced people who are drowning on our borders, I think it's clear to us at the museum that our work is not over. It's clearly a moment for us, for anybody, where public history and public debate, and I come from a policy-making background, where policy debate intersect. And it was a similar time that got me actually out of those corridors of Whitehall or Brussels and, and, and into Spitalfield. Because I went to uh, 19 Princess Street, which you're going to see later, with uh, a very great historian who died this year, Bill Fishman. Mm -hmm. and, and Bill was a, an academic historian, a local historian, a campaigner for social justice. And I was lucky enough to see this building first with him. And, and two things happened for me. Um, first of all, a, a deeply moving building. You know, a building that is 
that's been a home, that's been a refuge to so many new arrivals. It's symbolic of what, of the making of a, of a modern, multi-faith, multi-multi kind of community, country. And at the same time, I just left Brussels and I, I'd been sitting in my, in my office kind of watching Yugoslavia implode. And at the same time, I was writing speeches about why the European construction was important to the ending of war and genocide on the continent of Europe, and yet that was happening right on our borders. And it seemed to me so clear that the lesson of apparently stable societies, such as pre-war Germany or post-catastrophe Yugoslavia, was that <coughs> complex multicultural, for want of a better word, this is such a debased word, but that complex mixed societies are just a lot more fragile than most of us would care to think. So it seemed to me important to have a place that would connect past to the present and help to shape the future. And fast forwarding, fast forwarding a, a, a few years, you know, we now get a lot of plaudits for what we do. One I'm particularly proud of is, is The Guardian saying, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's a place that tells us who we are today. And, you know, could, dis could deconstruct that for quite a long time. But how, how do we do that? And one of the ways we do that is by talking about who is this we? Who is we? How did we get here? And that seems to me one of the most important jobs for public history today because migration is how we, or movement, is how we all got here. You know, even when we go so far back in history that the archaeologists take over from the historians, you know, those pioneers, those hunter gatherers arriving, they're not arriving from the same place or from the same backgrounds. They're coming from all over the place and they have different ancestries. <coughs> and whatever the differences between archaeologists on, on the details of, of those waves of migration, they're absolutely clear that Britain was shaped by waves of migration, different phases of migration and by trade in goods and technologies. And that's just as important, isn't it, when we look at the modern period when historians take over. So we need public history narratives that explore who this we is and the complexity of, and the changingness of that we. Where we came from, but also where we went to. Our own British diasporas and our expansions are outward movements of trade, our imperial expansion, our trade relations, and of course, crucially, the ways in which the outward expression of British power and influence are represented through foreign policy, through military interventions, through trade, which it's at least arguable tell us quite a lot about how they impact on other parts of the world and hence on flows of workers and refugees from those other parts of the world. So we need a story that is inward and outward, or we need stories that are inward and outward. But I think that's probably a good moment if we can... So you, you'll see, we, we're a place of multiple <coughs> stories, we're a place of multiple voices, uh, and you'll see a couple of them. Uh, in this, Bill Fishman and one of our, uh, somebody's helped us a lot, uh, a student, Gamal Singh. <coughs> Quite nice seeing Paxman frozen like that. <laughs> all sorts of places. According to an English heritage study released today, over 1,500 historically important buildings are in danger of falling down. They include pubs, a pier, a windmill, and a gorilla house. We let our culture correspondent, Madeline, hold out to visit one of them. Number 19 Princeton Street encapsulates the East End's restless history of human traffic. The weight of its past is palpably becoming too much to bear. 
As you can see, we've actually had to put props into the building, acro props, to literally hold up the upper three stories of the original Huguenot house. After the Huguenots came generations of Irish and Jews, all found refuge here. In the 19th century, a secret synagogue was built behind the building's Georgian facade. It was rediscovered in the 1970s. Like so much else in the building, it's faded, but almost untouched. Now there's a surprise inside this cupboard, which encapsulates so much of what's really, really special about this house. You see, layer after layer of wallpaper. Who put those wallpapers on? More recently, the house has drawn members of the Bengali community. Women have come here to learn English. It's now a museum to all the East End's immigrants, among them Sikhs, Somalis, and refugees from Eastern Europe. My name is Abdul Hanan, and my poem's name is Immigration. And the causes of immigration can be war, droughts, and lots of reasons. You can't flee to another country because you might not have a passport. You can't flee, you can't run, you can't hide. They had to run away from their own homes, had to go to another place. You lose your family. Bang, bang, bang. Local school children. A shared history of asylum has drawn one student into fundraising <coughs> to save number 19. Personally, in my family, my grandfather fled Lahore, which would have spouts become part of Pakistan, and there was an incredible amount of communal violence. And to flee that, and while the, the family's British passport and citizenship were still valid, they decided to come through to England. In the 1930s, this room was where Jews and anti-fascists planned their defiance of Oswald Mosley and his black shirts. They confronted each other in the Battle of Cable Street, just a stone's throw away. I saw this uh, an army of black shirts, two columns, uh, with, uh, defended by another massive column of police. A, the vanguard of the police were on horseback, and there was a Führer in front, Mosley, strutting in front. You could see them from, from where I was. And suddenly, this impenetrable, impenetrable mass moved forward to stop him. It's thought some of the Jews who later came to Princelet Street were rescued from Nazi-occupied Europe in the Kinder Transport Project. Many of their parents died in the concentration camps. Those who lived through those times believe there are powerful reasons to preserve a place of tolerance. The older supporters of this building believe the urgency in saving it is not just physical, but political. They've watched ruefully as tension between different racial groups and towards asylum seekers has become an issue once more. Well, the parallels are very, very similar. The attitudes to people fleeing from persecution, seeking bread and work as, as a last resort here. They are the scapegoats. Many of them are Asians or Eastern Europeans, exactly the same as the Jews post-1881, seeking bread and work, fleeing from pogroms. And that's why a building of this caliber is necessary to preserve. That's a Newsnight narrative. It wouldn't necessarily be our narrative. But I, I think it shows something about why place matters in creating a space where people talk to each other, where they encounter other stories and other voices. And we have an extraordinary opportunity at 19 Princeton Street, I suppose an extraordinary privilege that, unlike organisations like the Refugee Council, even I think Save the Children and many others, people come to us who are not already interested in these issues. You, know, you might think a museum of immigration, people come there because they care about immigration, they're interested, that's true, of some people and of some students and of some organisations. But actually way over half, probably more like three quarters of the people who come to see us 
are coming for all sorts of reasons. It's a, they've, they've heard it's a beautiful historic house, they've got Huguenot ancestry, it's an old synagogue, they read that David Bowie came uh, more <laughs> recently, they saw that IYY came. Uh, and uh, we can find moments of personal connection that can be very intimate. That can be about family history. That can be a sudden sparking and recognition of something in a family history or a family story or an experience that, that helps us and them to connect through history, which can sometimes be an easier way to connect to things that are difficult and painful and powerful. And of course, because many of us are refugees and migrants ourselves who will be in the building on any one day, you know, not in a glass case with sort of, you know, typical refugees stuck on it, but actually just being us and working and talking with people. So just to summarize a few of the issues where we found that we've been drawing on history rather a lot and, and possibly even more than we have done in the past. You know, obviously, just actually talking about the, the actual background of the 51 Convention and what the principles are, because lots of people don't know. Looking at the longer term impacts of family separation by talking about the kinder transport or the experience of people who've had to stay in camps for a very long time <coughs> because so many of the public think, oh, well, once you're in a place of safety like a camp, that's fine, everything's all right now. Um, looking at the stories of Belgian emigres in World War I, looking at past episodes when extremist and even mainstream parties have scapegoated new arrivals, making connections with some of the things that are happening today, and of course talking about dehumanising language. So just from some of that background and experience, it seems to us that it's still hugely important for us and, and for society to be connecting the past and the present and the future. And historians have a tremendous role in this to, to giving us good research that tells complex and contested stories, that talks about inward migration, that talks about refugee flows, that talks about the outward expression of British power and policy that connects to inward flows. And at the same time, we need small stories that help us to engage with big ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Right, our next speaker is David Feldman, Professor of History at Birkbeck and Director of the Pears Institute for the Study of Anti-Semitism. Thank you. Um, Margaret Thatcher um, famously said she didn't like people who brought her problems, she wanted people to bring her solutions. So rather, rather than seeing it as a wet blanket, I hope you'll see it as a sort of belated anti thatcherite gesture. <laughs> I, um, I bring you problems, not answers. Um, um, and I think also, it's, it, it's, it's important to, to say, uh, by way of preface, that, that uh, my comments will be UK-centred. Um, I'd like to start off by th thinking for a moment about the place that refugees play um, in our national story. And one gets this in the response to the current refugee crisis. Um, if there's one point of agreement on all sides, it's this country's been jolly good to refugees. So uh, the Prime Minister tells us he's really doing a good job in, in saying that we'll take in 20,000 people over five years and that this is in the nation's best tradition, which has always tried to regulate immigration but also let in people who have a just and worthy claim. And people um, who get up petitions who oppose this and people such as me who sign them, sign these petitions which say this country has a wonderful tradition of letting in refugees and the government isn't, um, isn't living up to it. But it's the place of refugees somehow in the national story which um, is agreed upon. And I think that this is really sort of um, a misappropriation of the, the, the past. I mean, uh, the country has a, has a best a mixed record um, um, over refugees. 
Um, and, uh, and it's a mixed record, which is abuse. I think the most egregious abuse um, was at the same time as the Prime Minister was um, initiated his commission on Holocaust memory, in which the um, place of uh, the UK in allowing in in in, in bringing um, in allowing in uh, refugees from um, Nazi Germany, Austria after the Anschluss, and, and Czechoslovakia has um, um, has a rightful place. Um, um, and the kinder transport and so forth. So at the same time as he was doing that, um, he was withdrawing ships from the Mediterranean that would be there, uh, that were intended uh, to be there, patrolling the seas to um, prevent um, migrants from drowning as they tried to cross into Europe. The two sides didn't add up in a sort of a, a great display of hypocrisy. Um, I'd just like to mention sort of a couple of other sort of problems in the way in which we conventionally think about refugees. Often the justification which is made for refugees is in terms of, of their contribution. And of course many uh, refugees do and have uh, contributed wonderfully. But what about those who don't or can't? Are they less worthwhile? Are their lives less important. So there's this argument which is based on utility. Um, I, I mean, I recently got um, a flyer for, for the, um, uh, for a I mean, a very good charity which does work with uh, refugee academics which have made this point. And um, <coughs> you know, I'm, I support the academics trade union, but really th th I think they should be supported not only because they're useful. There are, and then there are other arguments which are made, in a sense, in terms of which seek to draw um, on our empathy. I mean, Susie was making some of these arguments earlier. But, and it's not that empathy is unimportant. But there are some people with whom we feel less empathy. Uh, do they not have rights? And, and it's that term which seems to me to be absolutely crucial in the ways in which we understand refugees now, which is in notions of rights, whether we like people or not, whether they're useful or not. So that's just the one point about the stories we tell about refugees. I think it's important to understand that... Um, Britain's experience of refugees and of population movements in the 20th century has been unusual in Europe. Um, you know, it didn't experience the massive displacement, or, or, or had a far lesser experience of the massive displacements of populations which occurred after the two world wars. Just to give one statistic which uh, sort of uh, reflects how the experience of Germany um, has been different to the experience of Britain. In 1960, 24% of the population of the Federal Republic of Germany were German refugees um, or deportees. Um, so I actually just so it's, it's not so um, I'm not certain what the effect of that is on the way in which we tell stories about refugees but um, I'm sure it must have, um, have some effect just the um, uh, their demographic presence has been lighter um, and I think well, I'll come back to it on a related point in a moment. Um, Peter spoke about the um, about some of the difficulties of inserting refugees into history, and this is something he, he has much more experience of than 
I do. I mean, I, I, I'd just like to sort of underline, though, I mean, how great a problem this is. Um, not writing about refugees as people to whom the states respond or to whom uh, um, humanitarian agencies respond, but as people themselves who have agency. Mm. Um, you know, um, 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 Hannah Arendt sort of famously wrote about problems of statelessness and the, and the difficulty of uh, the right to have rights which statelessness denied. In a sense, what statelessness also it, it seems to, uh, to deny is the right to have a history. Because, of course, <coughs> so much history is state-centred. And it's uh, 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 not only in the sense that it's subjects of states or nations which become states in the modern period, but, of course, it's, it's financed by states. Of course, in recent years, in recent decades, there's been a lot of work inspired by history from below, giving other groups agency and subjecthood in history. And here refugees present a particular problem, because there's a question of, uh, uh, which is something really which Peter raised, which is, is there a collective subject here? Are, are refugees a single body in the way in which one can speak about, uh, some people might want to speak about a class or a sex as a single body. Related to the um, issue of um, writing refugees into history and writing them in as subjects, is the importance of getting it right, of getting history right. And, um, and there, it seems to me that there's a tension in this respect in the term public history, um, or there can be, between uplift and history. And um, I think that... Um, For historians, it's not that historians should be against, it's not that professional historians ought to be against uplift and against moral stories, but when they see stories being told in inaccurate ways for the sake of uplift, that it's, their, it, it's their professional duty to point it out. And I'm glad Susie is nodding, because <laughs> It's not quite true to say that immigration made this country what it is today. But I didn't say that, did I? I no, I didn't. I actually didn't. Not I, at all. Well, we'll, we'll I've go. never said this and I didn't say it today, I'm, so let's be clear. I'm very glad you didn't say it. <coughs> <Susie>. um, <coughs> immigration now is actually at unprecedented levels. That's neither a good thing nor a bad thing in itself, but we need to acknowledge that when we, when we speak about immigration and refugees more generally, and if not Susie, then there are others who, um, who do want to say that, you know, that Britain has, always, uh, um, has been made up of waves of refugees, uh, waves of immigrants. Um, and, of course, there is a limited <coughs> sense in which that is true. However, numbers and percentages count. And total numbers of immigrants are much higher now than they were um, and have been in modern history. And the rate of change is much, uh, is much higher. Um, the last uh, set of points I want to make is a, 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 the, the, the last a set of problems I want to draw attention to is um, the the, you know, the idea of the refugee brings with it a, a, an idea of an exceptional case, and yet <coughs> refugees 
when they present themselves in history, are always connected with other categories. You know, but we've all spoken about um, immigration, clearly refugees um, are connected with the category of immigrants, and they've also always been, in modern British history at least, have been connected with the category of the poor. And the identification of the refugee has been very closely tied up with the attempt to identify a category of the deserving poor. So, in that sense, the category of the refugee is in some ways more problematic than we might like to think, and I'll, I'll, I've probably been speaking for um, too long, so I'll just close with this example that, you know, that if we look at British history and we think of a group, these people really were refugees and deserving, people would think of the Jews who came over from uh, the Russian Empire um, after the pogroms of 1881 82. And in response to the pogroms of 1881 82, there was a protest meeting at the Mansion House which um, established a fund to help the refugees and and that's what it was used for but the people who administered the fund went to great lengths to distinguish between people who were real refugees and those who were just economic migrants who would have to live in London without uh, any assistance for a period of six months so the image of Jewish immigrants coming from the Russian Empire before the First World War as refugees is really something which has been imposed on that past in retrospect. When the first Modern Immigration Act was introduced in 1905, it did indeed include um, an exemption for immigrants who could prove that they were seeking admission in, into the country solely to avoid prosecution or punishment on religious or political grounds. Well, punishment or certainly disadvantage on religious or political grounds would cover um, the entire Jewish population of the Russian Empire. But actually, after the counter-revolution of 1906, the numbers let in as refugees barely made it into double figures each, each year. So it's not obvious who's a refugee and who's not a refugee. Thank you very much, David. Uh, right, our final speaker is Giuliano Fiore. Um, he is Head of Humanitarian Affairs at Save, Save the Children, where he's been based for four years, but he's also been a researcher for various NGOs, think tanks, the UN and academia on issues of conflict and development. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm the Head of Humanitarian Affairs at Save the Children. Uh, that means I work in a team that focuses on critical reflection for strategic purposes. What we mean by that is critical research, debate and political engagement aimed at improving our policy and practice and that of others within the humanitarian sector. Um, for the last few years I've, I've spent some time working with historians trying to well, by participate in initiatives that, that build bridges between historians and, and the humanitarian sector. Um, however, I'm not a historian, uh, I'm also not an expert on refugees, in fact I'm not an expert on anything in particular, but I have been told <laughs> that I'm a good blagger, so um, I will blag in a personal capacity. I'm going to talk about problems mostly, I will hint at a solution, and I suppose we can take that uh, being, as being a result of the fact that I was born when Thatcher was in government, and so <laughs> I don't know what life was like before she started <laughs> So the question of what, what is public history in light of the recent refugee crisis, I take this not to be about what is the impact of the so-called refugee crisis on public history, but more what light does the so-called refugee crisis shed on the state of public history. Uh, more specifically, um, in the context of the <coughs> refugee crisis, how is history being produced, and in particular, selectively and opportunistically reproduced and how is it being consumed in the public realm, and I'll particularly focus on uh, how the humanitarian sector plays into that. I suppose it's a particularly interesting context 
because it highlights a number of issues which are of secular importance to Europe. Um, the first being about the definition and assertion of national identities, but also about a, a pan-European identity, um, about the politics and ethics of transnational, particularly trans-European solidarity, um, but also about the viability of political integration at a moment when perhaps that's more challenged than it's been in, in, in a long time. Uh, I am an advocate of the development of a historical consciousness and the application of historical methods within the humanitarian sector, but what I'm going to do is talk about five themes within popular discourse on the so-called refugee crisis uh, that humanitarians have mishistoricized and dehistoricized. Um, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. You've heard me say so-called refugee crisis probably a, a number of times now, and, and that's because I'm going to challenge that it's really about only about refugees as we imagine them or as they're constructing the humanitarian imagination or even legally defined uh, or that it's a crisis at all. So first of all, the first thing is, is crisis. Um, now when I started focusing on questions of emergency response, I was struck by the peculiar re relationship between the humanitarian sector and history. Uh, it's an industry that doesn't have enough time to look into history. It's constantly on the go, it constantly needs, it needs to respond to crisis. At the same time, individuals working in the humanitarian sector seem to have a fascination with history, and humanitarian discourse is to a remarkable extent constructed on golden era narratives, on hagiographies and myth-making, on Whiggish reconstructions, and on marketable but dehistoricized prophecies, which often are quite apocalyptic, and, and therefore you can sell them to kind of and mobilize action. But most of all, what, what, what has struck me is the fetishization of what, I, what I've called the crisis frame. Now, I'm sure, as you, as you well know, we now live in a, a postmodern world of threats, a risk society when the best, where the best we can hope for is to be resilient to the shocks of day-to-day -day life, uh, when we go from one crisis to another without time for a cup of tea, or so we're told. Um, now this is a narrative that is abs absolutely ubiquitous within the humanitarian sector, and perhaps not least because humanitarians are supposed, they're supposed to be responding to the exceptional and the critical. But obviously this facilitates or allows for uh, a progressive humanitarianization of the world, and that's good for business. Incidentally, it also allows for a pro progressive securitization of the world, and that's the evil cousin of humanitarianization. Um, in a, in a time when there's very few resources for humanitarian uh, organizations, or, or, or so we're told, at least in the time of, of uh, post-financial crisis, you also need to emphasize crisis uh, in, order to, uh, in order to get a story that's newsworthy, in order to, to, to sell what you're doing and raise money. And not just any crisis, it has to be a, a, a progressively bigger crisis, a crisis that's, that's more shocking and more emotive each time. And so we're quite accustomed to hearing, this is the worst crisis since dot, dot, dot. Um, the other day I received an email from a colleague of mine who's working on uh, the, the, the pending drought and, and, and possibly famine uh, in East Africa as a result of El Nino. And he said to me, this is undoubtedly going to be the, the worst crisis in a number of decades of its sort, a food, food crisis. And I thought, well, that's, that's a, quite a big shout. And then he said, and the main rains in Ethiopia, ha uh, uh, the failure of the main rains in Ethiopia is unprecedented since 1989. Um, <laughs> and, and so then I, I, I was thinking about how, how we've been framing as humanitarian organizations the, the current refugee crisis. And it is along those lines. It's the worst refugee crisis since the Second World War. Um, now, I'm not necessarily contesting that, but it, it's a, a historical reference without broader historical contextualization, and that's really what I, what I talk about when, when I refer to mishistoricization. Um, now, it's clear that it, it, it's a pretty uh, terrible situation. There's, as of two days ago, 643,408 people that have crossed the Mediterranean. And clearly, on a personal level, on a family level, on the level of communities, it's a pretty critical situation. But for Europe, it's not decisive. It's not a crisis in, in, in those terms. Now, I don't say that because I don't think these people who are crossing the Mediterranean shouldn't receive support, obviously do. However, the crisis frame facilitates emergency measures which I feel let governments off the hook a lot of the time. So, crisis the first one. The second one, refugees. Um, 
in the humanitarian imagination, the refugee is constructed as destitute, as vulnerable, as suddenly stateless, and as ahistorical. Um, <coughs> in fact, if we look at the recent ref refugee, the Refugees Welcome campaign, hashtag ref Refugees Welcome campaign, this is exactly how they were portrayed. Um, they needed to be made to look as vulnerable as possible. Again, par perhaps part of a, a marketing tool, um, but it, 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 it reaffirms or, or reinforces a certain construction of, of the refugee. Then according to the 1951 convention, as, as I'm, I'm sure some of you might know, um, legally defined, the, the refugee uh, it flees based on a, a well-founded fear of being persecuted on account of race, uh, religion, political grouping, social grouping, etc., uh, to a country not of their nationality and without the ability to avail protection from the country of their nationality. Now, if we look at the current situation, um, that doesn't seem to be the case across the board. Uh, I have a colleague in, in my team who would happen to be on holiday in Eastern Europe, interrailing, on the very day that 10,000 migrants were, were fleeing from or, or were moving from Hungary to Berlin, she happened to be on the same train. Um, and spoke with many of them, and she said that many of them were, were middle class, um, many of them were doctors, she spoke to many Tunisians, she spoke to Bangladeshis, so not exactly the picture that we're, we're, we're presented with. I'm not saying that's a majority, in fact it's not a majority, the majority certainly are from Syria, then from Afghanistan, and we, we have information uh, about nationality. Um, but also that there's an article that recently came out in the Humanitarian News, Earring, about seven myths uh, related to, to the refugees. And certainly the, the portrayal of, of refugees in this crisis as, as being destitute, vulnerable, stateless, uh, historical, etc., doesn't seem to, to match up. Um, but that wasn't the case before, and Peter spoke about that. And in fact, in, in, in Peter's book, uh, you talk about um, responses to UNRWA, uh, I think, at, at one point, um, and an elderly Palestinian man who talks of uh, not being able to take his land with him, whereas his son-in-law could take his, his degree certificate. And I thought that was quite a, a nice example of how, I mean, that, that totally shatters really our, our, our traditional or conventional conception of, of the refugee. The problem is it's quite risky to start making these arguments because you can potentially feed into xenophobic um, uh, uh, <coughs> And I suppose that's the same with, with the crisis point as well. And, and so I suppose what I, I do is accept that the crisis and the refugee themes are half-truths that make the world go round, or useful half-truths, um, but still try to deconstruct them in some way within our humanitarian discourse. The third is solidarity. The notion of a humanitarian Europe is integral to our self-betrayal as civilized and progressive people. Um, within humanitarian agencies, you hear very often about the fact that the EU and the UK are two of the three largest donors to emergency response after the US. And we've heard much of the tradition in recent weeks of Europeans helping abroad and welcoming at home. And strangely enough, within humanitarian organizations, the, the, con the case that's most invoked is that of the Second World War. Now, um, you're a historian, so I'm sure you'll, you'll uh, be able to say much more than I can about how Jewish refugees were treated at the e end of the 30s by European states. Um, humanitarian agencies in particular have focused on unaccompanied children, and, and my, my organization uh, in particular being a child-focused organization. And so we've probably heard you know, uh, uh, 10 times on BBC News, NGO workers, sometimes alongside um, government representatives, invoking kinder transport as, as an example of, of how Europeans responded previously to, to unaccompanied minors or unaccompanied children. And in my organization, I've also heard about, say, the children's uh, tradition of, of responding to, to child evacuees. Um, the, the Spanish Civil War example is, is, an, is another one. But these are fundamentally problematic examples, and, and they're used in very anecdotal, uh, anecdotal ways. They, they involve stories of separation from, from parents and, and things like that. Um, and, and again, I think this is a, a case of mishistoricizing, using anec anecdotal information without setting in context. The next is about national identity. Um, liberals and humanitarians have regularly linked the idea of solidarity to a great British tradition, at least in, in this country, to a great British tradition, at part, probably as part of a call to arms. Uh, and perhaps this is history being deployed in some way in its more traditional role as a tool in the construction of national identity. 
However, if we take the kinder transport as an example, that's fundamentally problematic once again, not least because kinder transport was the result of charitable initiative, not national government policy. It was opposed by uh, large portions of the British public. Um, but then also, uh, it plays potentially into the idea of an empire in decline, this idea of we need to make Brit Great Britain great again. It plays into the, this idea of an empire in decline, which sits, perhaps for, for other, uh, other motives, but it sits quite paradoxically alongside inward-looking Little Island nationalism uh, in the rants, the xenophobic rants of UKIPers who would distinguish the refugee from the economic migrant and then say, and by the way, they're not legally entitled to asylum if they move into a third country. Now, actually, I find it quite ironic that in a time when every aspect almost of public and private life is being commoditized, and when aspiration is seen to, it seemed to be such a, uh, a value that we place so much esteem by, economic migrants is, is a term of such derision. Um, the fifth one, humanitarian geographies. History being deployed to reaffirm humanitarian geographies. Uh, the 90s, a time of war in the Balkans, <coughs> among many other wars, but a, a war in the Balkans. War came to the fringes or the margins of, of Europe um, in, in, a, in a big way, brutal, a brutal war for the first time in some time. And the people looked European, and it was shocking, and it, it, it was emotive to, to Europeans. Um, but we're told that before that, this is, this is the biggest of its kind. And so it seems almost like there's some kind of surprise or shock that we should be faced with, it, with, this, with this plight as a, as a civilized and progressive continent. Uh, as if the natural locus of humanitarian action is the third world and the hinterland on the periphery of capitalist civilization. But in fact, we don't need to look back too far to times when organizations like my own were operating only in Europe. Uh, in the first 10 years of, say, the Children's Existence, it was founded in, in 1919, it pretty much operated only in Europe, and it, as Emily Bourne, historian, <laughs> or say the children amongst other things, will tell you, it, it, it uh, had a, a brief foray into, into Africa in 1928, but really only in 1935 did it start launching um, bigger programs in, in, in Africa. So, from problems to solutions, uh, hi history and the humanitarian sector, and, and I'll, I'll close with this. Um, as I said, I, I, I do advocate for historicizing humanitarian discourse. At the same time, I think that the way it is used or history is used in the humanitarian sector is, is or needs to, needs to be challenged. And I think the, the refugee crisis <coughs> is a good example of how history is being commodified, commo commoditized rather. Um, the transformation of history into a cultural commodity is often pitched as something that happens alongside the democratization of history. In fact, I think it's not distinct. It, it is really part of that democratization process. Uh, and the, the Marxist historian, Raphael uh, Samuel, talked about a demoti uh, demoti uh, vision of history and an inclusive vision of history. But this is really being reshaped by the near managerial uh, imperatives of uh, efficiency, of impact, etc. So this is history for impact, history for efficiency, history for marketing. Um, now, history is not a repository of neutral facts and, and stats. History is a way of thinking about questioning, <coughs> um, analyzing the world as it was, and potentially inferring ideas about how it might be. And so I think it's in this, in, in this way that the humanitarian sector might think about using history or drawing upon history. Uh, history as a method for critical reflection. Elena Davy and John Borton, who were both at the Overseas Development Institute previously and have a link with uh, Manchester University, have talked about the contextual and strategic benefits of history. And I, I agree with them. I think, uh, I tell the children, what we're now trying to do is engage with historians. In fact, we've been doing so in a way that, try, that, that helps us understand our own culture and values and politics as much as uh, that of others, and for strategic purposes. In fact, we've been working quite a lot with Emily Bourne, who's, who's spending a week in, in the organization uh, this week thinking about how we can draw on uh, histories and how we can uh, use history as a, as a critical method. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, well